Do you ever freeze at the beginning of what should be a simple project because your brain goes, yeah, but what if it isn't? Because same. I was just going to make a cute little double layered rain cape in this gorgeous soft green waxed cotton and capes are just circles so this should be fast, right? But then my brain started acting up on me and I had to go double check with the keystone jacket and dress cutter because what if I missed something and ruined the fabric? Anyway, this is the waxed cotton from Merchant and Mills, the dry waxed look, and it is water repellent. I sent them an email and they confirmed that the wax blend they use for this one contains no fluoro compounds, aka PFASs, which I've talked about previously. But it is still a mix of waxes which melt when exposed to heat, and can also have some bad reactions to soap, so no pre-washing or pressing with a hot iron. My kind of project. I am also going to be cautious when it comes to pins and poking holes. We want things to stay water repellent after all. Now, I may be over cautious here, but this longest cape has both a center back seam and a shoulder seam on either side. To protect these areas most sensitive to water seeping in, I am making a shorter top cape with no seams other than for the collar. Layering capes like this was quite fashionable in Victorian and Edwardian times, usually because outerwear was wool and several layers would take longer for rain to penetrate. And while the body of my lining is a nice cotton, the lining of the collar is a nice fluffy wool. I do like keeping my neck warm. To try to investigate what kind of adventure we have embarked upon, I am starting with the collar, first stitching the two pieces together. This is probably wholly overkill, but I had this idea that maybe if we rub beeswax against the seam, just like we would rub beeswax on linen thread to strengthen it, there is less chance for water to penetrate through the seam. I can't heat seal my seams like one might with modern rain clothes, but I will try to make what assurances I can. Attempts at stitching this cloth by hand was, indeed, attempted, and if anything it just cemented the idea that we want to do most of this work by machine. With the collar more or less done, I realized I had forgotten to cut a coat loop. This had to be rectified post haste, but also turning small straps inside out is a time. The biggest cape just has two shoulder seams and the one long back seam to stitch up and subsequently waxed as best we can. There really aren't a lot of seams in this project. Treating cloth with oils and waxes to make them water resistant is nothing new though. Vikings would treat their woolen sails with such expert hands that 
while a fold but untreated sail would have up to 30% less air going through it than their unfold equivalents, a properly oiled sail, typically using a mixture of horse fat, fish oil, tallow, and or fur tar, had air permeability close to zero. Somewhat later, oil skin, or cloth treated with linseed oil, has been documented in Scotland back to the 1500s, where oiled sails would be repurposed into water-resistant clothing for sailors and fishermen at the end of their life. Next up, we have... I am keeping the decor minimal for the aforementioned minimal poking of holes reasons, but we are fast approaching the dark autumn season here in Norway as the nights grow longer, and much like biking without a helmet is not illegal, but certainly frowned upon, so is not wearing reflective items or clothing so the cars may spot squishy pedestrians in the impending darkness. For this reason, I found this reflective ribbon and have mathed out that there should be just enough to cover the edge of our longest cape for maximum nighttime visibility. Now, how do we line this fabric that is quite cumbersome to stitch by hand, but we also do not wish to pierce the front of it more than necessary? Well, to be honest, I thought we might just ask some bias tape to come to our assistance. Before attaching the lining, we must assemble it. And to be honest, I just relished a moment in this project where pins were not so much a challenge as an asset. So, we have reached the point in this project that I have been most anxious about, and that is when you have to mirror just about anything, but especially um, welt pockets. But they're not really welt pockets, hear me out. So I thought that, he said, it would be nice to have, you know, some capes have these slits where you can slide your hands out and still have this be nice and closed and keeping you warm for, I don't know, holding an umbrella or saying hello to someone, picking up the mail, what have you. You still stay nice and dry, but you have these slits. And I thought it would be nice if we did a... in the style of a double welt pocket, but you don't have a pocket inside, you just have your hand, but instead of a double welt like meeting halfway, you would just sort of overlap them entirely. Hopefully I'll show you this in a bit. But so this is where we need to figure out how to match them up on each side without excessive pinning. To be fair, the producers don't say you can't pin, but they say that if you do, you should do your best to pin within the seam allowance so that the final product is not the outside that gets wet and has water seeping through it. So I think that's what we are going to try to do. I'm gonna cut out my fabric pieces for the welt pocket armhole thingamajig and we're gonna try to pin it but within the sort of center bit where we are gonna cut. All right, let's do the thing. And while I have a larger piece of this that I could use, I am falling back on my old habits and piecing together this scrap from when we cut out the collar. I cannot in any coherent fashion manage to explain to you what this fabric smells like. It's like... It's not beeswax, 
but I would say it's somewhere along the line of beeswax adjacent, if that makes any sense. The most anxiety-inducing part remains, though, trying our best to true up the two openings and committing to it. At least here, we may pin with confidence within our chalk lines, as they all get turned into seam allowance on the inside once we're done. I was still unreasonably nervous about this, though. The most terrifying part done, we can finally get to the lining. And this is where our cunning plan from earlier finally comes to fruition, as we can, if we are cautious, carefully pin our bias tape only to the lining layer, leaving our precious outer shell intact. To access our welds that aren't pockets, we must of course also snip into our lining and fold those corners back. And then the tiny outer cape gets the same treatment sans reflective tape. For the assembly, I am definitely pinning the seam allowance. I am also attaching the small cape to the larger cape first. I just know that if I tried to do both cape assembly and the collar at the same time, it would be one big unholy mess. One thing at a time, thank you. But once that is under control, we can get to the collar and coat loop. It is a good thing Freya doesn't mind things getting a little bit thick. And at last, we can fold the lining of our collar in, encasing the last of the raw edges. The collar also gets a round of top stitching to keep everything neat and where it is. Now, you might wonder where we are going to fit any closures on this new friend, with no buttonhole plackets or ties in the lining to speak of. But that is because I have been wanting to make these cute little buttonhole toggles that you sometimes see on capes in historical fashion plates. These get stitched almost all the way around, corner seam allowances snipped into and turned inside out. Before they too get a round of top stitching. One buttonhole on either side to finish us up, and to be honest, these turned out even cuter than I had imagined. 
excellent little friends for our rows of buttons on either side to which they fasten. And there you have it, one anxious creation of a hopefully still water repellent cape. Uh, while there was just a light drizzle today and not a proper downpour, I can at least attest that I stayed nice and dry for this first trial of this new friend. And this is what it looks like in the dark. I shall be very visible on my little walks. As always, a great big thank you to my patrons. If you wish to support me in making more videos like this, that is the easiest way to do so.